I've tried to make the script for this video entirely self-contained. However, its viewing is enhanced greatly by having watched two previous videos of mine, the Buffy episode guides for Lie to Me and Amends, respectively. Both are linked in the description. During Angel's run, the series experienced two reinventions, where the skeleton of the show itself was changed. I mentioned in the last episode that there had already been a shift away from the case of the week, with Angel as the protective guardian, to a greater focus on our trio of do-gooders. But 5x5 five five cauterizes that change and uses the Rage and Slayer to reintroduce Angel's mission statement. This is a terrific episode, and a fan favorite for good reason. I have a couple of issues with it here and there, but it reminds me of the Buffy episode Passion. Like Passion, the final act leaves me holding my breath, and elevates 5x5 five five to one of my favorite episodes of the series. In this video, I also want to have a discussion about Faith's arc, and since Faith is a former psychological symbol of Buffy's, and works as a direct analogy to Angel, there is a lot to talk about. Pay close attention to this one, and Sanctuary. These are linchpins for both shows and what they have to say about love, Buffy. redemption, Sunnydale, L.A., Buffy, and Angel. Five by Five begins with a rather long and epic previously on, covering a full season plus two episodes of Buffy. A street criminal is being chased by three demon assassins when Angel and Wesley roll up and save him. Again, I'm always pleasantly surprised by the show's willingness to go there with the demon gore. It's definitely something unique to Angel the series. At the bus station, Faith appears in a reveal that always gives me a little chill and mugs a lowlife for his jacket and abode. Faith already looks angeled up from the hypersaturated Buffy season 4. Her time since the church appears to be wearing heavily on her. In flashback, we see Angel killing the Romani girl that would eventually lead to his re -insolment. Then follows a bit of an odd sequence. While Angel tries to save the soul of the ruffian, Cordy says all men are nothing but surface. Generally speaking, you don't change a guy. What you see is what you get. Scratch the surface, and what do you find? More surface. Cut to where Faith dances up on a girl's boyfriend, and he doesn't care. Faith decks the girlfriend, the guy tries to hit her, and she takes him out. This begins a melee in the bar, which Faith dances her way through as though it isn't there. There are a few things going on here, one of which I'll save for the end of the video. First, the bit with the couple works as a sort of pantomime callback to what happened with Riley and Buffy in Sunnydale. Skipping over the consent issue here, you can go watch that episode guide for the discussion. And then Faith ended up her both Riley and Buffy in the process. The dancing through the melee also works symbolically for her willingness to just ignore the chaos she's created and acting the way she always has. Just close your eyes and keep dancing. I like the themes, it's just the execution plays out a little campy to me, slightly Benny Hill. <laughs> In court, Evil Bazinga and Lindsay are about to close a case when Angel brings in the reformed ruffian and turns over Lindsay's apple cart. Lindsay and Evil Bazinga scheme to get Faith to kill Angel, and Lila wants in. Lila finds Faith at the bar. I guess we could go somewhere and talk, although I'm not much of a talker, I'm more of a doer. I think you might have misunderstood my intentions. The evil trio makes Faith their offer in exchange for killing Angel, and Evil Bazinga makes the mistake of thinking he's in charge. Faith politely corrects him. Bazinga! How do you look now? Bazinga! Bazinga! She shows initiative. Bazinga! Back in flashback, a newly ensouled angel returns to Darla, who is confused. What is this? Have you met someone else? No, buddy. I just want to feel something besides the cold. Darla kicks him out, and Angel tries to feed again, but his conscience won't let him. Faith tries an old trick she'd used on Angel before. It doesn't work. That was so cool. Angel suggests Team Angel split up. His persistent early attempts to keep people away from him in the first season are part of the point of the first season. But after it's gone badly enough often enough, it starts to feel a little like Cabin in the Woods level satire. We gotta play it safe. No matter what happens, we have to stay together. This isn't right. We should split up. We can cover more ground that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, good idea. Really? Later that day, Faith tosses Angel a gun to see if he'll shoot her. He aims for her torso. I don't know why he throws the gun back to her, blanks or no, but she uses it to try and needle him into action. At her place, Dennis tries not to let Cordy and Wes in. I love Dennis, but when he finally does, Faith is there. I realize there have been failures on both sides. But I also believe in my heart that you are not a bad person. What do you believe in your heart now? This is as significant an episode for Wesley as for anyone else. If everyone on Angel is in L.A. to atone for something, then the need for Wesley's redemption was created from failure as Faith's watcher. This moment with Faith gives him a real chance to atone for his previous failures. Wesley absolutely knows he can't overpower her. If he can avoid playing into her game, letting her actions inflame his anger, and just find a way to get through to... Oh... Kidoki. Instead, Wesley acts quickly and violently without consideration to the cost. It may be a fist pump moment watching Wesley stand up to the out of control Slayer, who has been taking a wrecking ball to all the people we care about, but it's significant that Wesley just forfeited this possibility of atonement for vengeance and validated the toxic behavior of someone in a suicidal tailspin who is trying desperately to convince everyone that she is not worth saving. It's a shocking moment and more important than it may seem. This begins a remarkable scene between them. It's a case study in dramatic tension and character. Incredibly tense, but there's very little violence shown in the shot. Everything is implied, hinted at, the actual horror isn't on screen. And what makes it work are just monumental performances from Dushku and Denisov, along with some pitch-perfect musical coverage. As strong as he is in this scene, Faith's attempts to terrorize Wesley worked on me completely. We've only done one of the five basic torture groups. We've done blunt. But that still leaves sharp, cold, hot, and loud. Uh, can we go with Tickle? In an episode that wasn't quite holding together for me, this scene is Giles' walk up the stairs to La Boheme. There is no looking away from this moment on. I was your watcher, Faith. I know the real you. And even if you kill me, there's just one thing I want you to remember. You. Are a piece of shit. You should talk. We've seen Wesley's vulnerability in earlier episodes, but this episode gives us a glimpse of something darker. Something more vengeful. It is also the end of bumbling Wesley. As the series has gone on, there has been a growing pattern of rashness or impulsivity revealed in Wesley's character, and it appears that Faith is succeeding in convincing everyone else what she is. You're nothing! Disgusting! Murderous! Fit! You're nothing! The bad guy. As Angel tracks her down, Faith looks emptily at a shard of glass covered in Wesley's blood, which she drops half-heartedly into the alley. I wondered if it was to bait Angel closer with the smell. But after making Faith a terrifying character through the torture of another that I already loved, Dushku and company did enough with one single shot to completely restore my empathy for her. It's kind of a marvel. In the shard of glass, we see the horror of what she's done, and in her expression, we see her horror at who she is. As Faith menaces Wesley with a blowtorch, Angel comes in to save the day. This is a terrific fight, but what makes it work for me so much more are Angel's lines during the brawl. First, he cuts instantly to the quick of her braggadocious artifice. This isn't about Wesley. It's about you and me. No, baby, he's payback. For what? I thought you were happy with the way you are. He is so incisive in this scene. This could be one of my favorite Angel moments in the series. The writer's using everything that he is so he can save someone. Wesley breaks loose, and so does the fight. But it's important the way Angel fights, never really with initiative. He deflects, he drains, but he doesn't really attack. When she lunges with a stake, Angel takes the fight outside. I wish I could make the world better place for you to wake up in. But the hard pill to swallow here is that once I'm gone, your days are just plain numbered. <laughs> And as Angel strips away Faith's reasons for attacking him, her real intentions start to become clear. Wesley cuts himself free and grabs a knife to jump into the fray, but in the alleyway, Faith's defense is crumbling. I know what you want. 
and I'm not going to do it. Before we go any further, let's look at what has led up to this moment to try and understand the characters in the Buffyverse in a way we maybe haven't before. We've spoken at great lengths about the show's philosophy and portrayal of the soul as the moral compass, and how it is the moral compass that enables us to make choices that might be contrary to our own self-interests, as varied as those self-interests may be. In other words, the soul is what empowers us with genuine free will and the possibility of making choices that fill our life with meaning. To this point, we've also spoken vaguely about the role that love has played in the philosophical model. Buffy's show makes clear that one of the reasons for her longevity as the Slayer is the love she shares for the people around her. Mother, father and Giles, and Xander and Willow. You're the Slayer and we're like the Slayerettes. But I've also suggested that the soulless and the evil in the Buffyverse can love. Lacking a soul doesn't make you incapable of loving, just incapable of loving selflessly. To put it all into perspective, it's useful if we take a look at the three Slayers we've met in the Buffyverse so far. Faith, Buffy, and Kendra, all three of which have souls. Loosely, the three of them actually work quite well as symbols for Freud's three aspects of the human personality. The id, the ego, and the superego. The id, faith in this case, is our inner child. The id is the source of every impulsive desire we have towards loving and being loved, joy, rage, and, post-adolescence, sex. As much as we might intellectualize and romanticize our ability to love, babies aren't born with any sense of duty or purpose, but obviously are attached to and show affection for their mothers from birth. Attachment and affection are just terms that fall under the broad umbrella spectrum by which we define love. And as we get older and become more complex, so too do the ways in which we desire and show affection for the people closest to us. Kendra, symbolically, would be the superego, pursuing duty and the ideals of the Watchers to a fault, almost totally at the expense of love, friends, or indulgence of any earthly impulses. This element of personality is not the soul itself, but it requires one in order to be present, which is why vampires are all id monster. For now, Buffy is the ego, or balance between, walking the tightrope between the passionless superego that would be anger you're feeling. And the reckless and impulsive id. But it does not mean that we get to pass judgment on people like we're better than everybody we else. We are better. But Buffy's show is about becoming an adult that lives with authenticity, which to me means accepting an ongoing process of integrating the impulses of her id and the demands of her superego into her own unified identity. In other words, someone who loves herself while always striving to be better. And the engine of that process is living an examined life. You must be so disappointed in me. No. I know you, Anne. So afraid, so pathetically determined to run away from whatever it is you used to be, to disappear. I'm Buffy, the vampire slayer, and you are? Before I was the slayer, I was... Well, I, I don't want to say shallow, but... Let's say a certain person who will remain nameless, we'll just call her Spordelia. Look like a classical philosopher next to me. Becoming a better human being, then, is not simply a matter of environmental coincidence combined with the inevitability of time, but requires a healthy, as in non-neurotic, amount of introspection. We can't actually make a meaningful choice if we deny what we've done, or who we are genuinely in this moment. And to some degree, Angel's show is more full of characters grappling with that ongoing process of adulthood than Buffy's. And if it goes away, it's like... Like what? Like I'm still getting punished. For what? I don't know. For how I was. For everything that I said in high school, just because I could get away with it. Well, why you? And we all got something to atone for. I'm a fraud. The council was right to sack me. What do you want, Angel? I want... <laughs> Forgiveness. Yes. That's the truth. As I've said before, if Buffy is principally a show about growing up, then Angel is a show about being an adult. It's important to make the distinction that just because Kendra and Faith work well as symbols doesn't mean they aren't also complex characters. Kendra had human impulses, but denied them in the name of duty. Faith acts almost entirely impulsively, but there have always been indications that she wants to do more, as when she fell victim to Gwendolyn Post's manipulations, or even her subconscious dream self giving Buffy the key to the mayor. There is much evidence in the Buffyverse to suggest that a necessary balance for living a moral, ethical life is love. As the title suggests with Out of Sight, Out of Mind, Marcy's inability to connect with anyone around her eventually led her to turn completely invisible, and following that, insane. The loneliness, the constant exile, she's... 
<laughs> she has gone mad. Hers is not simply a hedonistic spree of violence. Jonathan's inability to connect with anyone led to his suicide attempt in the clock tower, where Buffy tried to share with him the perspective that everyone is suffering. Everyone is turned inward. But rather than developing that empathy for everyone else and letting that bring some peace to his own pain, in Superstar, he made himself the nexus of everyone's focus. Jonathan, you can't keep trying to make everything work out with some big gesture all at once. One way or another, our innate desire to love and be loved must be grappled with. But I wouldn't dare oversimplify as to say the reason Faith committed evil was because she wasn't loved enough. We all suffer loneliness and loss and cruelty. But certainly Faith came to Sunnydale with some open wounds and lacking the tools for closure. She makes no mention of her father, but her mother is dead and we can infer what her upbringing was like. Mom was so busy, you know. Enjoying the drinking and passing out parts of life that I never really got what I wanted. She also witnessed her watcher's grisly murder. She has a use them and lose them attitude to any of the men in her life. All men are beasts, Buffy. They are not a source for connection. But she and Buffy were, for a few episodes, on the verge of making that necessary connection for her, before the recklessness and impulsiveness which she brought along with her to Sunnydale causes a morally abhorrent act that she can't take back. And she reacts as someone with a hungry, unfed id might. There is no body. I took it, weighted it, and dumped it. Body doesn't exist unable to take responsibility for her actions. Her denial causes a permanent rift with the one person she might actually have had a healthy connection to. And I think perhaps having been the victim of some monstrous acts in her lifetime, the only way she can understand Alan's murder is that she too must be a monster. And with that, Faith tumbles into darkness, abandoning free will for the only source of connection she can find. The problem is that the mayor was soulless. And because of that, the mayor's love could only be conditional. In this case, upon his being able to control her. Oh, hey, 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 shoes, shoes. If you failed me in that way, well, you know, replacing Mr. Trick was chore enough. He didn't hold faith to any higher moral standard as Buffy, Xander, and Willow hold each other, because he was incapable of one himself. But he did love her, and one of his final acts on Earth was to leave a message and one last shot at Buffy. After the body swap in Who Are You, Faith gets a taste of the life she's always wanted. A mother who loves her, friends who include her, a tender, intimate boyfriend, and people who express great gratitude towards her for being the slave. Her decision to go to the church is her first moral choice she's made since Alan's death. But she doesn't want to live as Buffy has. She wants to be Buffy because she... You're nothing! Disgusting! Murderous! Bitch! ...is tainted. When 5x5 Five Five begins, we find her dancing alone, eyes closed as the violent consequences of her actions domino around her. This scene is so reminiscent of another that I think we might interpret what she's imagining as she moves alone across the floor. And the name of the club is Club Hell, a callback to another episode, Anne, when Buffy abandoned her calling and ended up a nameless nothing in a hell dimension surrounded by victims she couldn't save. What is hell but the total absence of hope? the substance, the tactile proof of despair. But in Faith's hell, she is the devil, the rotten and selfish monster ignoring choice and free will, because not doing so would mean having to take responsibility for the deeds she can't take back. It's a hell in which she is the evil person she's afraid she is, constantly escalating the violence with a single specific purpose in mind. In the finale, she regularly refers to herself as bad, which we can interpret in this case as someone who has murdered, and she uses the same term for angel. I thought you were bad! And since she had a soul and murdered several people, she thought she might be able to get Angel to kill her, if given enough incentive. She even tests if Angel is ready to go all the way. You didn't shoot to kill. We're gonna have to up the stakes. Just as Faith's story parallels Buffy going to LA to escape herself and ending up in hell, there were two instances of Angel attempting suicide because he had given up hope. The first I pointed out earlier in Buffy Season 1, Episode 7, and the second is in amends. To be clear, though, the weight of the soul may often be a source of despair, regret, and hopelessness, but suicide is still an act that emerges from our id, which is why Spike is capable of attempting it. It's an act motivated to remove one's self from suffering, pain done to you, or the pain of what you've done, coupled with the belief that things are truly hopeless, that either we lack the ability to affect actual change in our lives, or that we don't deserve it. Am I a thing worth saving, huh? Am I a righteous man? I'm evil! I'm bad! I'm evil! 
After Angel decides to keep fighting, his first real client was actually Faith in Consequences. If you can trust us, Faith, this can all change. You don't have to disappear into the darkness. Wesley botched Angel's chance there, but in the final scene of the episode, despite all the horror she's capable of inflicting on him and his family... I know what you want. And I'm not gonna do it. Angel's unwillingness to kill her and to bear every punch is an immutable act of compassion. Finally, for Faith, and after she's done absolutely everything she can to prove she doesn't deserve it, an act of selfless, authentic love. And if she's worth that, then maybe it follows that there's hope. After all, the episode in which Faith premiered was called Faith, Hope, and Trick, which was a play on Corinthians 13.13, and now these three remain. Faith, Hope, and Love. But the greatest of these is love. It's complex, it's beautiful, it's gut-wrenching. I love this episode. The psychological mechanics going on are absolutely lovely. And as much as I may have a complaint or two about the opening, the back half is flawless and just emotionally devastating. Wesley dropping the knife is one of the most beautiful and cinematic shots in the series. And if Angel lacked a big bad before, Lila and Evil Bazinga scheming to have him killed certainly cements their role in the Angelverse. In this series, we've been using Buffy and Angel as mediums for discussing life, philosophy, and psychology. But I believe it's important to make an addendum to this one. As much as I think the characters work as interesting models for authentic living, they are always saved by another's love. Angel is saved from the void by Buffy, twice, Jonathan, and here Faith. And that works well in drama. But the hard truth is that oftentimes our suffering is solitary. Our self-hatred something that we flay ourselves with from the shadows. As I've said in other videos, part of finding the will to go and get the rock is not just believing that there are things worth fighting for, but accepting that you are one of them. In truth, I'm not sure that unconditional love exists, except in our capacity to give our own away freely, including to ourselves. And whatever has come before, there is in every passing moment an opportunity to create good. That's hope. Which has ended up being my reason to hike back down the hill for another go with the rock. The hope that in a day or so, I'll create something new that might provide someone a moment's peace. I don't, always, but it happens sometimes. And when it does, it's enough. She's one of us now. She's a monster. She's an innocent victim. So were we, once upon a time.